Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Ferris. I'm Oto, Missouri and Cherokee. Um, I live in Norman, Oklahoma, so I'm a little bit behind you guys in time, which was good for me because I was running late, so it's perfect. Uh, we're all running on Indian time today. Um, so I, the best way to describe how, why I make work um, is that I really had no chance to escape it. Um, I was the child of very passionate collectors um, growing up, and I literally grew up in the world of Native artwork, going to galleries, museums, artist homes, and I really, really didn't like it when I was younger. Um, it was something that my parents were into, and nobody really likes what their parents like. So um, it was interesting um, to have that informal education, and as I got older, I started to see things that um, I could I could see um, the artwork that I was interested in um, being kind of brought through. So um, I was very much a kid that was into comic books and um, pop art and that kind of thing. And so when I started seeing artists that were native um, incorporate some of those things, I was really um, just kind of taken aback. I was like, oh wow, this is actually native art I could enjoy and and um, and so at that point, I, I became a collector as well um, and just sort of stumbled into the business uh, working for a small museum. Uh, I ended up having my own um, gallery here in Norman for several years. Um, and when I closed that, I had a number of artists that I worked with that I was very close with. And um, I had all these ideas for pieces that I really wanted uh, to have and to own. And, you know, so I would reach out to my artist friends and say, hey, paint me this or make me that. Or what do you think about maybe doing this as a project? And a lot of them were very accommodating at first, but now uh, at a certain point, um, some of them just said, hey, why don't you make something? And I was like, oh, well, there's, there's an idea that I just really had never struck me. Um, but since I had just all these weird ideas, uh, that I just never saw anywhere else, I decided that that's what I wanted to make. So um, I really, it's simply to say that my work uh, exists because no one else makes it. Uh, and so I uh, find that I feel kind of a, an interesting gap in what is being produced today. And it's kind of cool to see that there's a whole genre and generation of artists that are my contemporaries and younger um, that are doing similar things and, and really kind of starting to see um, native art um, come into its own and, and kind of develop its own identity outside of uh, something that's made strictly for the tourist trade or something along those lines. So tonight, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, try to make a piece for you while I talk. Uh, it's something that I done before. It's doesn't always work out perfectly, but I think I have an idea, so it should be something kind of interesting. Um, so by all means, I would love to see um, if you guys have questions, comments, uh, concerns, please put them in the chat. Um, and the fantastic staff is gonna read those to me while I uh, work. And hopefully I can talk and draw and paint all at the same time, but we're gonna see how that all works out. So. Um, is there anybody, before I get jump right into this, uh, is there anybody out there that has a question right off the bat? And we have a, a robust audience tonight. I'm just gonna wait and see. Oh, we do have some folks. Hey guys. Um, by all means, uh, jump in here. So what I'm going to be doing tonight, um, I've decided is I'm working on a piece of ledger paper. Um, this particular paper um, was, uh, you can see is dated. Uh, 1926. Um, this comes from, I believe, a law ledger. Uh, and it's just literally someone keeping track of their business, uh, their, what they're charging folks. And I really love using ledger paper just because I, I really appreciate um, just the beauty of the penmanship in it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Ashley, can you pin the drawing screen, not my talking screen? Um, if she can, if she can, we can do that individually. If you if you click up, okay, at, yeah. The so there is another board. Tom Ferris. <laughs> yeah. um, you can go right up there, click on the white dots, and click pin, 
And so it'll bring that up. That's what's um, pinned for mine at least. So now you can kind of see. So hopefully everybody can see now. Tom, um, Tom, Tom uh, can you yeah. can you explain why ledger or why ledgers were used and are used? Sure, so sure. So um, during removal, a lot of tribes uh, and native people were given uh, ledger paper that was used to kind of keep track of who was being removed. And so they would depict uh, historic moments um, from their tribe. So uh, prior to that, you know, we have winter counts and, and other pictographic histories that were pretty, uh, wampum belts, belts are another good example of that, pictographic histories that tribes have used. And this was just the next step in that. Um, so I, it's odd for me because I come from a tribe that also has a written language. Um, the Cherokees have our own written language. So we uh, kind of have a, a more interesting history in that we were able to kind of write it. But on the Oto side, you know, we didn't have that. And so there, there definitely is that pictographic history that exists for that tribe. So it's interesting to be on both sides of that. Uh, so today, there is a whole generation of artists that take those historic ledger drawings and use them as uh, basically as uh, influence and, and um, have developed their own style based on seeing those um, pieces in museums. Uh, and so I myself rarely, if ever, do what is considered to be really traditional ledger art. Mine is usually, um, so, well, just like all of my art, is usually some form of humor, satire, uh, something along those lines that kind of talks about either my personal history or um, just maybe my tribal uh, history. So, okay, so hopefully everybody can see now. So anyway, so this is ledger paper. This is a, a piece I pulled out of a book earlier today. Um, I have the complete ledger. It's probably about, uh, well, there we go, about that thick. And um, so I just really love using this as um, a medium because despite it being almost a hundred years old, this paper is very supple. Um, it doesn't crinkle, it uh, takes ink and paint very well, and is just cool to kind of take something that otherwise I think would be discarded uh, and not really paid attention to, um, and, and kind of giving it a second life and, and really kind of utilizing something um, that is otherwise trash, which is, so it kind of goes back to the the whole use the whole part of the buffalo <laughs> uh, aspect of native culture that uh, is so pervasive. So um, more backstory on me and kind of informing this uh, piece. Uh, my Oto Missouri name is Chadonahe. It's C H A D O N A Y H E. Um, I'm named for my great 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 grandfather, uh, who was a, a chief for the Oto Missouri tribe. And that name means standing buffalo. Um, so a lot of my work, uh, and I also happen to be Buffalo uh, clan on my Oto side. Um, there are seven clans of the Oto tribe, seven clans for the, uh, the Cherokee tribe. So there's a lot of overlap in that. Um, I'm wolf clan on my uh, Cherokee side, Buffalo clan on my uh, Oto Missouri side. And so in my work, you'll see a lot, well, my work and my collection and kind of everything, you'll see a lot of buffaloes, a lot of wolves. And so I kind of created this character that I would kind of heard about before, but I kind of gave him a, a little bit of more of a life uh, as Buffalo Man. He's a very like um, a very stoic, um, just man with a buffalo head. Um, and he's usually featured in a series of pieces that uh, also feature uh, other characters from native mythology. So um, the Pier Woman and uh, Coyote the Trickster and um, but but for him in those pieces and just I, I just kind of like him he's sort of uh, like my avatar sort of um, but uh, so tonight what I want to do is to do just kind of a cool little stampede stampede of more traditional um, uh, ledger style buffalo with uh, buffalo man kind of stuck in the middle um, as being um, the black sheep uh, sort so to speak um, because so often I'm, I find that my work is, is perceived that way um, as far as uh, just being in, in the native art circles. It's, um, it's something that uh, definitely 
perplexes a lot of people, I think, uh, which is fun. That's kind of what I, I like about doing work is that I get to kind of um, see what people understand right off the bat and what takes a little bit of explanation. So, um, and of course, like right off the bat, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna make a mistake. So just get it right in there with the mistakes, folks, it's okay. So uh, now that I've spoken at length, uh, were there any particular uh, questions out there? No. Okay. I don't see one. Um, but Tom, can you talk about your process that you're working on now? Um, you typically sketch in and then what is your layering process? So for me it, on this, like I said, since it's such a, uh, a wonderful um, product, this paper that is, like I said, almost a hundred years old, um, just is so great for receiving um, ink and paint that you really don't have to do much with it. It's pretty much um, fairly, uh, it, it takes the opaqueness of paint very well. So you, you don't have to go over it too often. Um, now working with canvas, for example, you generally, um, unless you're working with oils, which I just don't do because I don't have that kind of patience, uh, you generally have to paint uh, multiple times to get good coverage. And well, at least for me, because I'm in my, my style, I'm a very graphic person in that uh, I like just really sharp, hard lines. I don't really like um, too much as far as, um, I don't know, blending goes. I want, I want it to seem like a comic book. Uh, so, I mean, my work is obviously very, um, based in the kind of cartoon world, comic book world. And so I kind of continue to uh, do that and what I do. And yeah, I, I might just start rambling once I start drawing. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Unless you give me something specific to talk about, then I, then I can kind of hone in. So like I said, this character, Buffalo Man, he's a pretty stoic guy. He's easily annoyed. <laughs> um, he, in, in this series at least, um, he's usually kind of the, uh, the foil. He's always kind of the, uh, you know, dealing with all these crazy, you know, native art creatures that, you know, are, you know, they're a little wild. I don't know uh, how familiar people are with, with the native mythology, but we have some interesting characters that do some out there stuff. So, uh, and so in my mind, at least, I kind of like to think that, you know, all these characters that are from native mythology are real. You know, I, I know enough people that have experiences um, with, you know, having met Deer Woman or, um, you know, having stories of, of little people, um, you know, so I tend to take them pretty seriously. And so when I think of these characters, you know, they're like everybody else. They like to uh, have a cocktail, like to hang out and just kind of enjoy life when they're not, you know, scaring people or whatever they do. <laughs> uh, you know, Dear Woman is not always the most friendly or hospitable, but that's only if you're on her bad side. Oh, sorry, let me try to keep this also within frame. And the other part that I like about this series is that I, you know, as I said, started my career as a fan. So these characters are modeled after a, um, Palm Springs artist uh, who goes by the name Shag. Uh, and he does this really cool mid-century modern style of, of, of artwork that, um, you know, he features, you know, uh, the Rat Pack and all that stuff that you'd see based in um, Palm Springs, the, the cool architecture, 
cocktail hours, tiki culture, that kind of stuff. And what I love to do is to take our characters and put them in that setting. Because one of my biggest frustrations as a, uh, as a fan, or I'm sorry, as a fan, as a native person, let me put it that way, is that when we are mentioned and depicted, we are you know, usually uh, discussed or, or talked about in a historic uh, setting. We are rarely, if ever, given a, a contemporary context and so to me, there's a lot of people that just don't, oh, here, so we're gonna start with this. So this is basics. So there's a, we're rarely have ever put in to um, modern times or even more contemporary settings in the past. So I love the fact that uh, the mid-century modern era existed. I love everything about it, you know, but, more importantly, I love the fact that Native people were there. We lived in that time. We lived in those houses. We experienced all that stuff, even though we are hardly ever portrayed doing so. And so it's important to me to kind of take those opportunities to depict Native culture in those, um, it sounds silly to say, but anachronistic settings uh, as far as like, you know, if you think of the pop culture uh, depiction of native people, anytime outside of a Western, we're, we would be kind of anachronistic, you know? So I would much prefer to kind of have our um, ability to kind of, you know, show us in whatever setting we would like to be in, so. Okay. So I continue to work. Does anybody have a question yet? I'm really pretty good at interactive. You don't wanna let me just talk to myself. So Tom, so, how do you just- no, please go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so what you're drawing now? How how did you? Um, I mean, you, you you talked a little bit about about the, the mythology and being inspired by that, but this specific thing, why why this tonight? Well, um, this goes. Uh, this for me is kind of a little bit of a um, a depiction of how I kind of see myself or my work. Um, in, in contemporary native art um, that, uh, you know, what people want is this more traditional ledger style Buffalo. And, you know, they would be perfectly content for me to just to do a row of these Buffalo running across this really beautiful paper. And that would sell and would be amazing. But I, there are people who do that much better than I do. And, and I highly encourage people to seek those people out and, and support their work. I, I kind of want to make the weird stuff I want to make. And so to me, uh, this piece is, is very kind of uh, representative of, of how I see um, the perception of my work. You know, it's just a little bit, it kind of sticks out. This buffalo sticks out from this buffalo. And that's not always a good thing, but for me, that's what I enjoy. So you said you wanted to do different things that were different than the norm. You have two ledger pieces in the gallery right now. Do you want to talk a little bit about those while you're working? Uh, can you tell me which ones? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's so horrible to say. What do I have there? <laughs> Hold on and I'll pull up the titles real quick. Thank you. Uh, and so lots of this, uh, you know, there's there's some reference here to um, my southeastern heritage as well as the more um, the Oto Missouri's that were a little bit more of the the ledger art uh, tribe. You know, the the fork die is definitely um, a reference to southeastern iconography and um, so for me, 
Uh, I like to kind of throw in little bits here and there, wherever it makes sense. Um, so. I have to apologize, I have a very insistent French bulldog that's trapped out of the, the room that really desperately wants in. Okay, so one of them was about deer woman and it was hunting dangerous game. Oh, <laughs> so that one, okay, so that is, the depiction of that piece is a little bit more uh, traditional and uh, it's, it's very um, simple, and rudimentary shapes uh, because these were just quick sketches people were doing literally at gunpoint and being moved across the country. So they weren't you know, highly refined detailed pieces. Uh, and so the details really are kind of uh, interesting what they chose to include where they were very detailed in regalia or in um, certain aspects that they really wanted to convey, whereas other things like faces, things that they didn't really kind of seem as concerned with were like, oh yeah, yeah, everybody's got a face, but you know, his tattoos are like this, or, you know, his, he was wearing this particular shirt. And those are the things that I find uh, interesting, what they chose to uh, really get highly detailed on um, versus what uh, they chose to obscure or to not focus on, I guess. Uh, okay, so I have the, oh, ah. see, I, I completely go off topic. So the, the story of that piece um, goes back to the Dear Woman story, um, which I really love. It is the story that I was most often um, forced to hear from my mother uh, when I was younger. Um, she was very overprotective and really um, uh, always scared us with stranger danger stories. And that's essentially what, what the dear woman story is. It's, it's um, you know, she's this captivatingly beautiful woman and uh, she's so beautiful. You never take your eyes off her face. And because of that, you don't realize that she um, has deer hooves for feet. And so she will lure you out away from camp, away from the fire, away from, you know, all, all your safety. And, uh, and then once she has you out there, she stomps you to death. It is, at, you know, at its core, definitely a uh, stranger danger story. But I've always captivated by Dear Woman because she did tend to focus on kind of the men who probably deserved that a little more than others. And so it was usually some level of justice in her um, target, I guess would, would be the way to say that. Um, so I love Dear Woman as a character and I, I've really been intrigued to see uh, her develop as a pop culture uh, reference now and so much, you know, she shows up in um, Reservation Dogs. She's uh, been in a little bit of a horror. Uh, there was a, sh a short-lived horror um, anthology, I think, on uh, Showtime that had a, the Dear Woman story, which I was really impressed with because you know, it's, it's rare that our stories are, are told. So it was kind of cool to see it. It wasn't super <laughs> accurate, but it was, it was still fun to see. Uh, I, I enjoyed, you know, just the uh, depiction of our stories. And what was the other piece I have? I can't think of what I have plus draw. I'm just not not that no time. you're fine <laughs> it was Cherokee cousins Chewy and oh. Sasquatch <laughs> oh, also, and the family yeah. reunion yeah so that also is um uh Sasquatch is a another character from this series that I uh kind of created he's a Sasquatch that wears or he's a sassy Sasquatch that wears a squash blossom so he is Sasquatch um, definitely uh, one of my more favorite characters that I've uh, kind of come up with because I really love the concept of um, Sasquatch. It's just one of my favorite kind of, I wouldn't even say guilty pleasures because again, like with Dear Woman, I'm like, ah, oh, he's probably out there somewhere. And there are enough, you know, native people that I know and respect to know that I'm like, yeah, uh, that's probably real. 
So I don't know. I it's hard to see here. So I'm going to kind of do this. So if you can see, we're backwards. Okay. I'm sorry, this is upside down and backwards. So for me, it's a little bit silly. Uh, so as you can see, there's um, Buffalo Man just kind of standing in this stampede of, of real Buffalo. And so that to me is kind of a pretty good depiction of how I see myself. It's like, yeah, he's a Buffalo too, kind of. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, I'm an Indian artist too, but you know, my stuff is kind of weird. So that to me is uh, kind of how uh, I, I really like to kind of see myself, I guess, <laughs> which is really the, um, the point of that character is it is the, the self depiction um, a little bit. Uh, I like the idea of uh, there being a black sheep amongst Buffalo. That's just a funny concept to me. So now we have, so this is the basic. So this is the sketch, which is great. It's a really good base. And from this, um, we'll use paint. And like I said, with this, it's not like um, canvas or anything that needs a gesso cover because this paper takes it so well. Um, you don't have to do that, that base level um, painting. Okay, anybody else have any um, questions, concerns, comments? Has anybody seen the show? Uh, yeah, Tom, we, we screened um, the, that episode of Reservation Dogs um, oh, good. Well, last yeah. week and, and had, had a panel from, uh, uh, from the Catawba Nation uh, you know, just sort of sort of talk about it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great episode. I met the uh, the art show. Is anybody in the audience that's watching tonight? Have you guys been to the center and seen the show? Oh, sorry, that would be paint, by the way. All right. So one little trick that, um, and again, it, I was very fortunate to have this really amazing group of supportive artists that I worked with as uh, you know their their sales representative, but then really kind of became you know their contemporary to a certain degree. Um, that gave me all kinds of you know nice little tips when I was first starting out on you know maybe where I wasn't doing this right or wasn't doing that right or could save myself some time and effort and really so one of the little tricks that I got uh, bequested to me was um, to add a little white mixing paint which I'm sure to any any real art student oh, that is the other thing too is I'm very much self-taught um, very much a um, you know we'll figure it out as we go kind of a person <laughs> so I tend to jump right into things um, as you guys can see there I have a a car that was a whole process that I had no idea what I was doing that was just one big well let's jump in and figure it out kind of thing so mixing white paint with your colored paint before you um, apply it was a trick that was passed along to me by fellow artists because it has just a little bit of opaqueness to your paint um, and just allows you to kind of cover a little better. Well, um, and so yes, as a fair warning, since I am self-taught, please <laughs> do not consider this to be any sort of professional tutelage here. And the other thing with the way I work is so much of what I do you know, it ends up being outlined and um, covered for this reason or that. I, uh, I have a lot of play in what I'm working on. So I'm able to kind of fix things at the end if I don't have everything perfect going in to it. I don't know if that makes sense, but. At this point, I think I'm just trying to fill space. 
or dead air, I guess. Okay, good. Good to know we're still on camera. So the other thing I do, and um, you know, I try to reference the people who have come before me and done a much better job. Uh, I like to kind of put little Easter eggs and things that I do, um, just so um, those people that I I really kind of admire. Uh, get a little bit of shout out just in the weird stuff that I make, or at least that I'm giving um, appropriate credit, I think. Um, so for example, I'll probably paint at least one of these buffaloes blue. And for me, that's a big reference to uh, AC, uh, yeah, AC Blue Eagle who created um, uh, Ijoji. This is the little blue deer. It's a book done in the uh, 30s. And um, it's a really cool book that so many people grew up with, so many native people are familiar with. And so it's such a, a huge part of native art because after that, everybody did their version of a blue deer. Uh, I mean, if you go through native art history, well, I guess more contemporary native art history, you'll kind of see the the blue deer period, uh, which I loved. I loved kind of seeing everyone's interpretation because, um, you know, they were very open and free with their work at that time. They were collaborative and I love that about that era of painters. Tom, is that is that paint or ink that you're using? This is just acrylic paint. Right. And so I'll use a whole variety of stuff on this piece, mostly paint, but it'll have some ink or paint pen to go over and do the, uh, uh, the, the outlining. Um, I've learned to not use Sharpie for anything that you hope to have any sort of uh, life just because it uh, just fades so quickly. Um, so I have a tendency to use this, a really good ink pen or my real preference is a paint pen because it, it has the same integrity of what you're actually painting with, um, but has that uh, ability to be, um, to flow and be easily applied. So are any of the, um, what is it, uh, Lancers in the audience, uh, you know, native art majors or uh, any artists watching? It is the Lancers, right? That is your, that's your mascot, right? Yeah, so then, yes. Yeah, I think I bought a hat. <laughs> Okay, well, probably not any uh, public speaking majors in the A. <laughs> so Anna says yes, that she is an artist. Oh, cool. Anna, what do you do? And please don't feel like I'm putting you on the spot if you don't want to answer. Or don't be super hypercritical too. Like, God, this guy's a horrible artist. I think, she, I think she's a mime. Oh, hey, that's <laughs> that makes so much sense. A little good Marcel Marcel story. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and also, uh, this is a little bit of a expedited process. Usually, this would probably be a much more refined drawing um, and um, probably a little more care in the, the application, but it is, this is really how I work. Um, I know so many of my friends that uh, advocate for um, working on easels and that's just not, not for me. 
I really enjoy the ability to just hold and turn and twist and get weird, odd angles on stuff just because it's easier to work with. So Anna says she, uh, I love printmaking and drawing, but I mainly do digital art and animation now because it's so easy to erase and I cannot go back to paper. <laughs> yeah, I just did. Um, so we had a, uh, the Cherokee Nation just put on its first indigenous comic con in Tahlequah, Oklahoma here. It's probably about two hours from where I live. It's the headquarters of the Cherokee Nation. And, um, for that, it happened to be on um, November 5th. And so part of my contribution to that was I did block prints in person of a, a Guy Fox mask and said, remember, remember the 5th of November and have the logo of the con on it. So I'm just, a, you know, I myself am a huge pop culture nerd, so, for me, making stuff is a way to kind of give homage to what I really love as a fan. And um, hopefully give, um, you know, make people appreciate the things that I love or not make them, but help them that way. Sorry, I'm just color mixing over here. And a, very official painting palette that is, I believe it's 100% styrofoam. That's, that uh, sounds about right. Um, where do you get the ledger books? So I was very fortunate. I have three. And um, mine, let's see. The first one that this uh, set of paper came from um, was a trade. A, I had a customer who collects um, just antiques in general. And so they had this uh, ledger and traded work for um, the book, basically. I said, here, I'll give you this book if you make you know, a couple pieces for it, for me from it. And so I was more than happy to do so because, you know, I've since then, uh, let me see. So this, <laughs> that's hard to see. This is the ledger book. And I've maybe gotten through a third of this giant book. And, uh, and I use it a lot. And it's one of those things where I have decided to be a little more liberal in the use of it because I kind of want to get to these other ledgers that I have. And at some point I want to start, you know, mixing up some of the paper and, and for certain things I will use other ledger pages. Um, but uh, so this one I, I traded for, I have one that was a gift and I have one that I, um, whenever I travel, I tend to um, shop around for them in antique stores or um, Boston was amazing. I found a really cool ledger in Boston. Um, just because they have that paper from that time. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm always on the lookout. I, if somebody has it, I, I you know always want to see. Plus, I also have other um, artist friends who do ledger work that will trade a little bit of paper for of this paper for some of their paper just to kind of have some variety, um, which I really like about that. It it gives. Um, me a little bit of uh, opportunity, well, just like them, uh, to kind of uh, change up the background of their work and kind of bring a little bit more um, range, maybe. But I really do enjoy making um, prints as well, Anna, because it's such a satisfying process you it's like instant artwork it's awesome like all the all the work is on the front end and so once you actually start printing pages it's just like boom piece of art boom piece of art boom it's really um it moves quickly once it once you get going 
And so I definitely understand that, uh, the love of um, doing prints. Digital, you know, I've, I've played with a little bit. I, am, uh, I will be that old man that I'm just like, oh man, I was just a little bit after my time getting into computer or stuff. I've, um, my, my biggest thing I think I did on a computer was I, uh, I redesigned the Back to the Future um, hoverboard with um, Cherokee uh, syllabary and translated all the um, words on the board into syllabary. So that, and that was not done probably on any program that any self-respecting um, digital artist would claim, but it worked out pretty well. <laughs> All right, any other questions out there? Comments? The peanut gallery? A reference that I'm sure is <laughs> lost here. Hmm. No. <laughs> have you have you always uh, done ledger art? I mean, is that something you you started off with, or did that come later? No, it came later. Mostly with um, I I started doing ledger because I had an idea for a series which I did um, that reimagined World War II propaganda posters. Um, as Indian War propaganda posters. And I made them on ledger paper with the idea that, you know, if, you know, natives were cranking out propaganda posters, it would be on ledger paper because that's what, what they would have at their disposal. So um, I. Pro prop propaganda from the native side. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Now, I, I, I'm pretty sure that that propaganda already existed from the uh, United States side, but. Um, Actually, I've, I've seen some of it. It's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, uh, and of course, like I said, the majority of my work is um, steeped in satire, parody, and humor. And so, um, for example, I had, um, I parodied the I Want You for the U.S. Army um, poster with um, Sitting Bull instead of um, Uncle Sam and uh, said, I want you to fight the U.S. Army. And uh, that was a pretty, it was a, it was a fun series because there were lots of things you could kind of take from that. Um, for example, there was a whole, which I was completely unaware of, but didn't realize how heavily messaged this was. But I guess during World War II, venereal disease was a huge issue. And so there are lots of um, like anti civilist posters and stuff that were bizarre. And so I took those and parodied those um, uh, into a, a, a smallpox blanket parody. Um, but that's when I first started. Oh, well, and then from there, um, the other big idea I had fairly early on with ledger paper was um, I did a whole and continue to do a whole series of um, ledger paper dolls um, because I had the idea that if if adults had ledger paper, you know, at some point kids got some too. And, you know, what would a kid do with ledger paper at that time? They'd, you know, they'd make a toy out of it or something. So. I made ledger paper dolls, uh, ledger paper airplanes, um, those, uh, what are they called? Fortune tellers, those um, things you like go like this with. Uh, oh, great, I just got paint on there. Um, all out of ledger paper um, or with um, 
you know, syllabary and, and I made it, you know, kind of all native. And it, it worked out really well. The, um, the dolls were the most popular thing. So that, that series continued, but um, I really enjoyed just kind of, <laughs> not to sound trite, but thinking outside the box when it came to ledger paper, because I wanted to do something that nobody else was doing, which is again, this whole piece right here, um, being the weird Buffalo man in the, the herd of Buffalo, you know, that is, eh, that's very, a very poignant and astute observation of my, my work, I guess. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to clarify, Anna uh, says that she has uh, one when you were talking about the um, propaganda posters, and I was just curious if, if she can respond to what, what sort of uh, poster she has. Oh, she has propaganda posters? I saw it in history class and bought it for my wall. Oh, love it. Yeah, there, there are some good ones out there. Um, I did one that was about food rationing. Um, and it depicted, you know, the the German soldier um, helmet and just like a right across the, the nose line. So it was just kind of shifty looking eyes under a, a, a British helmet or British, I'm sorry, Nazi helmet. Uh, and so I kind of made that a conquistador image. And uh, I really had a lot of fun with that series. It was it was uh, an interesting take. And People really kind of responded well to it, mostly because I, I, I maintain that uh, Native people in history are so underrepresented um, and that I, I really wish that, you know, it was like the History Channel, like, oh, it's pretty much all about World War II, but I'm, I'm, you know, was wishing like for, hey, Native, maybe Native, Amer ah, Native American Heritage Month, we can kind of, you know, treat it the same way, but for Native culture, I guess. The odd ideas I have randomly. So what is uh, the rest of the schedule for uh, your Native American Heritage Week? Well, we're, we're down to uh, one last event after a, oh. a series of, of many. Um, tomorrow we'll be um, screening Prey for, for the campus. The, the oh, man, it's awesome. Go see it. I went to the premiere. I met um, Amber Heard and, um, oh, God, what's his name? Dakota Beaver? Uh, the two stars. It's it was really yeah, good. Oh, Amber, Amber, Amber Mid Thunder. Yeah, Amber Heard. No, Amber Mid Thunder. Say Amber Heard. <laughs> I'm in the middle of painting. Please forgive me. It's <laughs> different, different superhero genre. Uh, yes, Amber Mid Thunder. Uh, and she was really cool. Um, I'd been a fan of hers for uh, from previous stuff. So it was kind of yeah. cool to, to meet I, her. I, I loved her turn on the, uh, her part on the Legion. Legion? Yeah. yeah. I got a chance to ask her about that because, you know, she basically did that and then pray. Yeah. I said, so are, did you plan to be an action star or is that just kind of the roles you were offered or was that something you intended to do? And she said, yeah, uh, she was um, actually a really um, high ranked MMA fighter. That was oh. what she was trained to do. And from that, um, because of that, she was able to be cast as Carrie in Legion. Yeah. And so it just has said it's not something that I really kind of went out for intentionally, but it's, you know, something that suits me. I was like, oh, that's cool. Well, it, well we're showing that tomorrow. And then uh, afterward, uh, Brent Learned's going to gonna join us and talk a little bit about, um, about his. Oh, yeah, because he did the. Yeah, he did some of the uh, depictions through the um, the credits. And yeah, that was something that um, prior to ledger art, 
was, you know, they, they spoke very specifically about this, was um, they called it Hyde art. And yeah, it's like winter counts and a pictographic history on, on um, Buffalo Hyde. Um, so that just basically preceded this. Um, so it was just a, a, a different um, medium, a transition of medium, I guess. Uh, and it's showing us her, if you, if you want to look up at the screen, showing us our, uh, her uh, propaganda poster there. Oh, that is, yeah. that's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Now, yeah, I, I love like vintage posters, things like that. And that so much of my work is um, influenced by, by pop culture, advertising, artwork, uh, just those things that really are more ubiquitous to your everyday life that you maybe don't um, consider art or consider to, you know, be earth shattering. But I mean, so much of what we consume today is based on nostalgia. So I think to not recognize the effect of, you know, what's come before us would be kind of silly. Uh, all right, we're all over the place tonight, man. And I'm just digging through a big bin of paint and all kinds of goodies that I have stashed over here. And I can't really show you because my camera's taped down. <laughs> all right. So that's a, that's a blue buffalo. Yeah, so well, and so that is one thing with this on occasion, it will need to be, I will need to do a little bit of touch up, but yeah. And once it gets closer to being done, I'll switch cameras, but yeah. So this is a, you know, the stampede, stampede of the blue Buffalo, which again is kind of an homage to um, AC Blue Eagle and uh, Ijoji, uh, his book and his take on the blue deer. Um, and like I said, it, it just kind of turned into something that uh, every every native artist of, of his era kind of did their take on. You know, everybody kind of had their their blue deer moment. So no, nothing to do with the high priced dog food. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> that that came well. These were deer. Yeah. The, <laughs> no, my dog does not get uh, expensive dog food. He probably, as a matter of fact, I know he wouldn't really eat it. I have a uh, a dog with the worst dog palate ever. He just likes cheap dog food. So, um, has anyone interacted with the car on campus? Any of the students? I know a lot of people have been using the uh, QR code and looking at it oh, and scanning cool. <laughs> it. That's good. That, yeah. And they've been asking about the Cherokee Superman in the gallery. So, uh, yeah. So, that's the actual painting that the the car sticker came from so it's um because i'm not super talented as far as uh digital design goes i still have to just go back and just do a big painting and then basically take a picture of that painting and make a sticker out of it not the most effective way to do stuff i'm aware but i really enjoyed that process it allowed me to kind of um revisit that character which i hadn't done in a long time uh, I, I did it very early in my career, and it it's one of those things where the concept that I often find odd is, you know, I don't really make stuff with the intention or concept of perpetuity in mind. Um, and so when you make something that you're just like, like, for example, like this, like, you know, I'm just having a good time chatting with folks here, painting Buffalo, and uh, I, I don't have any intention for this to, you know, exist anywhere for in a collection, but it happens. So like that Superman piece, I did just on a whim, not the one that you have, but the original one that was done. 
um, that was kind of the inspiration for that whole project. I did that just on a whim when I was first starting out and it was purchased by a museum, it entered a collection. It was nothing that I ever intended to have happen. And so it's a little odd uh, seeing that the original piece now, um, I wanna take it home and fix it. There are like so many little things on it. I'm like, ah, I just wanna fill in this or I wanna fix that or, it's interesting to kind of be put in that situation where if I had known it was gonna go somewhere, uh, forever, I probably would have done not something different, but just I don't know. There's there's little tweaks I'm like oh man, I wish I could have, wish I would have done that instead. Oh, randomly getting a phone call. Hello. So I just kind of pick and choose where I want to focus on. I, I try to let some areas dry um, as I move through it, just to kind of uh, allow um, any kind of updates or, you know, um, updates, wow. <laughs> any kind of second codes or anything to kind of uh, go over it for a more opaque look. Um, so. So Tom, since you uh, had asked about uh, our, our programs this month, I wanted to mention to folks that uh, most, if not all of them, will be on our YouTube page before too long. And if I'm not mistaken, we have some uh, some uh, short videos on our social media uh, of you and, and your work and the car and so forth, too. Was that at uh, when I was there to deliver it, from what we recorded then? Yeah, when we recorded those, I believe uh, Ashley's put some of those online. No offense, but just know that I will. It was when you were them. delivering. <laughs> no offense, but what? I will never watch them. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I, I, I really hate watching myself. Like it, I, I don't like it at all. Um, well, that was more for the other folks then. That, that, yes, yes, yes. So that's why I was like, with your work. <laughs> I, I love the fact that you did it. I will never see. It. <laughs> <laughs> just like I will never watch this. Yeah. Um, but I hope everyone's enjoying it. I love, I love that we're doing it. That's just. Um, I'm sure like a lot of people, you don't like hearing yourself sometimes talk or I will uh, hear that or I'll just overanalyze the amount of times I say um yeah. or something along those lines. Well, if, if, if never read the YouTube comments, that's. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. I, I definitely learned that lesson a long time ago. I don't, yeah, I don't really get in go for comments. That's also why I don't watch videos <laughs> because they have comment pages. <laughs> But I think that um, that also helps me uh, be a, a pretty candid interview um, because I know I'll never listen to it. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna say, say what I think. Okay. My biggest fear is at some point I'll, someone will actually quote me with something I said and it'll be something horrible, um, out of context probably. <laughs> and I won't even be able to say, I don't think I've ever said that because I don't know what I said sometimes. Not that I think there's anything out there, I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, all right. And with this, I still know that this is really just the, the general fill. Um, we'll go back at the very end and do final outlines that will really clean up a lot of line work uh, and really sharpen everything. And there are some things that I just don't even touch until that point, the bow tie, for example, um, the eyes, that will all be done. Um, that will all be done with a, a paint pen just for the preciseness necessary to do it. Um, though it's just lots of layers of different stuff. So, uh, 
there's only what one native art major or native artist in the group. Anybody else have a favorite artist or favorite art style that they particularly care for or study or anything? So now I'm just gonna go back through here, go over a couple little spots and give it a, just a little bit more of an opaque cover. Um, not something I always do, but since I've, I am kind of letting the time frame get to me on this. So this is a little bit messier than I usually work, but I'm also kind of enjoying the idea as to whether or not I can actually get this done in the allotted time frame. Time frame. We have an answer to your question, Monet. Monet, okay. Why? And I think someone else listed, um, or Anna also listed John Singer Sargent. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that too. I'm liking Botero, what's his name? Botero more and more, where he did, everybody's fat in his pan, in his pants. Uh, Botticelli? No, no, no. It's Botero. I think he, I don't know if he's a Spanish artist or or a Latin American artist, but okay. uh, like I was thinking, like a Ruben S. Ruben. <laughs> well, they're they're like that. No, they're sort of. Uh, I don't know. It has a sort of surreal quality to it, and almost cartoonish quality to it. Oh, nice. So it's like a cherub. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. I have to say, I, I, I made a, a coworker's life uh, so much better by bringing back cheer wine, uh, which is not available here. There was lots of, that was uh, interesting to kind of see the um, regionality represented in the soda aisle, I guess. But there, I'm sure it's not. Well, I know it's not a rarity, so I don't think it has that same kind of effect for most. Do you have Sundrop as well? No, no, we don't have Sundrop. We had. Um, we have. Oh God, what is it? Uh, or oh, no, no, no. We do have some. We don't have Squirt. You guys have <laughs> Squirt, don't you? Occasionally. <laughs> okay. Well. Taco Bell, but um, <laughs> no, there were, it was interesting. So my dad is a huge fan of Tahitian treat uh, that you guys have an abundance there. And so I, I was bringing back all, all the bootleg sodas came back from South Carolina and North Carolina. It was quite the trip. If I'm not mistaken, um, our, our, I guess, I think local, Carolina local grocery store food line carries a cheer wine ice cream. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> that I did not see. I would have definitely uh, partook. Or at least taken a picture of it. It's interesting that, um, you know, since... The crossover of native culture and things like that, um, you know, cheer wine is not foreign concept here. So many people love it because they have attachments to that part of the country. And I, I, for example, grew up in um, Chapel Hill. And um, so I really love coming out to that part of the country. And um, I just know that there's so many people that I work with and know that have uh, so many touchstones to that part of the country. It's interesting to see all the people that know each other. So I'm, I'm happy that the car has um, 
uh, survived. <laughs> I wasn't sure how it would do. I mean, it's it is a car for you. It is built to be outside, but uh, I baby it a little bit. Yeah, it seems to be holding up well, and um, it's a conversation starter for sure. I think I've I actually had a conversation with two different people about it just today. They were asking me about it. What are they saying? Uh, when is this thing getting the hell out of here? No, just kidding. <laughs> Maybe. No, they were just asking about the project in general. And I'm like, well, did you do this, uh, the QR code? And they're like, yeah. So yeah, I, it's a um, long video. I don't really want to watch so many. <laughs> <laughs> it's seven minutes. Yeah, that, that too, like what I love about that piece, because I mean, it, it's cumbersome in so many ways, but I love it because it incorporates literally everything I do as an artist in one piece, which is something I've never been able to do um, before. I, uh, you know, it, it, I get to show off, you know, the paintings that I do, um, the woodwork, the um, just random weird stuff. It, it definitely um, speaks to my sensibility as far as uh, <laughs> the crazy stuff I make. It's, it is the, the best representation of just the, outlandishness that I come up with, I guess. Um, and funny story, uh, it's really odd. Um, uh, that car has fans here. And one of them um, happens to be a, a, a guy that um, sees the car often, noticed that I didn't have it, and was kind of sad that I didn't have a project anymore and gave me a car to start building a new project. And so, uh, that is leaking in my front driveway right now. And so trying to figure out just what to do. Uh, that car that you have was such a long time coming. That idea was in my head for years before I thought of the, well, I didn't think of it, but the, just the, where I had the ability to hunt down and the financial wherewithal to buy a car strictly to make an art piece out of it. Um, you know, it's not something that I've always able to, always been able to do, but fortunately I got that one at a good enough deal to do it. And this one, hopefully we'll start another project though. It's not, like I said, that idea was so crisp because I had years to put it together. This one is like, Oh, I've, I've gotten handed an opportunity without that depth of thought behind it. So I'm kind of curious to see what comes about with something that's a little more extemporaneous. Like, hey, let's just jump right in and see what um, happens organically. And with this one, I the video that's, uh, that's uh, on the QR code for the white car is the first thing that first video project I'd worked on, gosh, in decades, but was a, a very early passion of mine. Um, in high school, I was fortunate um, to attend a school that had its own TV channel. So we would produce TV shows for the cable news network, or well, the cable, we had our own news network through the cable system we have here in Oklahoma. And so we would produce these little high school shows and it wasn't, you know, Oscar winning, Emmy winning content, but it was a really cool opportunity. And a really, um, I really developed a love for uh, videography and, and uh, video editing. And so if you watch that entire video at the very end, it does say shot on an iPhone and edited on an old school Mac. And it is, it is very much a, this is what I have right in front of me. This is what I can do um, right this second. I didn't really have, um, I was under a timeline and, and didn't have an opportunity to, you know, get a really high-end camera. And I also didn't really want to. I, I wanted it to be very much a, I want to do everything on this project and I want to do as much of it 
with under my own skill or um, knowledge as possible. Um, and so I like the idea of just that guerrilla filmmaking, hey, let's grab the car and we're gonna go drive around and um, shoot some video. And um, it, was a, it was something that I'm probably going to do more with. And with this new car project, um, will be more of um, more intentional from the beginning, and so we'll probably invest in a uh, a decent camera or some sort of um, I don't know <laughs> something with a white balance on it because <laughs> the video drives me crazy. I love it so much, but I if I could just white balance that phone, that would have fixed so many problems. But those are all things you learn in hindsight. So that works out for me. Okay, any other questions? I feel like everybody's just waiting for me to say something horrible on accident. Just no, I think so. everyone's enjoying your painting. Oh, this is like a um, visual ASMR. <laughs> well, so if anyone in the audience tonight, think about this. I, uh, if you were asked right now to create a piece of artwork, what would you come up with? Anna might have a little bit more preparation than that, but that is a little bit of how I uh, had to approach the evening. <laughs> um, what I like about um, me, at least, is that I kind of have um, a life's worth of uh, weirdness to draw from. And it's always easy to just go self-reflective with your artwork. It's like, yeah, this is, if you, if you can't think of anything great to paint, just paint about you. So, I need some questions. I think that should be the assignment. Everyone has to come up with one question. Starting now. <laughs> no, and there's just deafening silence now. See, if you wouldn't have asked. <laughs> you would have one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, don't demand something. Oh, man. Yeah. So when you do um, Buffalo Man, is he yeah. always... Um, Scowling? <laughs> huh? Drinking. Scowling or drinking? Uh, well, that or so classy. I mean, you have him in what looks like a tux. Yeah. So it, for me, it's the um, it's the vibe of the day. You know, I like um, it. Buffalo Man is always going to be depicted in the um, kind of mid-century modern style. That kind of always ready for a cocktail party. Um, you know, that's it's it's always wine o'clock somewhere. Um, but that's that was that whole era, you know, the 
the cocktail party was, you know, the rage in those days. And so to me, I just like that. Again, like I like the idea that those characters are, are real and what they do is, you know, their jobs are taxing like everybody else's jobs. And so, you know, they, uh, they like to have fun just like everybody else. So they, uh, They're gonna have a cocktail, they're gonna hang out, they're gonna not have to deal with the the native people in their lives right now. <laughs> what's what's a Buffalo man's cocktail of choice? Uh, uh tonight he is uh drinking bourbon on the rocks. Classic. But he's <laughs> often a fan of um martinis just for the aesthetic purposes. <laughs> um, but yeah, tonight's uh, He's drinking Buffalo Trace bourbon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I figured that was um, apropos. So yeah, and that's word. very hard to find for some people. Uh, you do have a um, comment in the chat. It's uh, from Anna. She said, do you ever humor, uh, use humor from your own life, like funny stories? My parents, family have a lot of material. So I like to write and create those stories. Um, hmm. I mean, not so much anecdotal. Uh, it's more along the lines of, you know, what I draw inspiration from would be more the cultural aspects. Um, the little things that um, all native, well, not, I wouldn't say all, but a majority of native people feel like they have in common. Um, there, there are cultural touchstones that are pervasive among native people. A, for example, the you know saying that a, that is uh, kind of a cross-cultural thing for native people, and it can be used in so many different ways. It's you know it's the it's a joke. It's a, a defense. It's a like hey. I wouldn't do that or you know it's it's so multi-purpose but it is so ubiquitous with native people that it's just one of those things that um it doesn't matter what tribe you are you you say it you heard it you know it um those are the things i really like to talk about in my native art those inner tribal truths spam kamad cheese um you know getting beaten by your parents, stuff like that. The stuff we all grew up with now. <laughs> Just those those um, aspects of Native life that everyone uh, can identify with, or Native people can. Um, but in doing so, I also like to kind of show off what where those commonalities exist outside of Native culture too, and that you know, that's why I like to use so much pop culture iconography, because it is one of those things where just a gentle reminder that, hey, you know, Native people like Star Wars too, or, um, and, and in this particular case, you know, Native people were here for uh, the mid-century modern era, and I don't know, I'm just such a, a fan of that particular era of, well, maybe not social life, but just uh, architecture and culture. And there is a big um, emphasis on uh, being cultured and, and being involved in the arts. And um, that was such something I think we've really kind of lost. And that is one thing I would like to kind of, you know, regain people who can have an appreciation and support the arts and um, have cultured conversation that, you know, I'm going to sound like the old man. It's like, oh, yeah, that's just not about, you know, what is it, um, reality TV or something. Well, that does make me sound old. All right. So now that the basic colors are in, we're going to start doing some line work. A variety of options, um, ink, paint,
You're, if you're digging through a backpack, don't worry, I'll be back. Well, since we're looking for stuff to talk about, since we're all on Zoom still, even though that is something that is um, hopefully less of a reality for folks in the near future, what is the weirdest thing you've seen in the background of someone's Zoom? I just uh, always, always try very careful of what I have in my background, but I know not everyone subscribes to that concern. Most of the time I'm lucky if they cut on the cameras. So <laughs> I'm the same way though, as I have my camera off right now, but it's mostly due to making sure that you can actually hear me instead of seeing me and then not be able to hear me. <laughs> right. Yeah, I would much rather people hear than, well, <laughs> I guess for me that probably wouldn't work quite as well people hearing and not seeing, but you know. It's not so much weird, but uh, cats. Cats. <laughs> cats are, are That's why weird. my dog is not allowed in here. He would yes. just be all back in the background, raising pain. I've I've had uh, I've had mine jump on the table and they're behind the camera, but then uh, you know, he'll drop his tail down, <laughs> and so there's a big giant tail that goes across the screen, which is sort of an odd. Yeah, unfortunately, my cats are not like that. Uh, my cats are the kind you have to um go on an expedition to find until it's time to eat and then they're everywhere oh that must be nice <laughs> you'd be surprised i'm i'm, I'm harassed by my yeah. <laughs> well you know yeah. probably need to seek out uh, some sort of help <laughs> okay. uh, someone on the, on the chat here joshua uh, i'm sorry who's that josiah uh said i saw one of my teacher's dog try to try and open the door by jumping up onto the door handle it was a glass study door. <laughs> well, it could have been worse uh, to jump through the door. All right, students, any other, anything interesting you find out? Any professors have anything revealing or weird in their backgrounds? <laughs> you can private message if it's about anybody here in the discussion. I'm just curious. <laughs> Man. When you're looking for that one thing to finish an art project and you can't find it. All right, folks. I will be back with two shakes. Again, put the um, easy listening hold music on now. I'll be right back. That was quicker than I expected. <laughs> uh, see, now that would be the weird thing that you see uh, in somebody's thing. Like, um, oh, I actually tripped and broke my neck and just awkwardly on Zoom for way too long afterwards. Okay. I thought I had everything in place, but then. Really? No Zoom stories from the, oh, someone on my dog, teacher dog, oh, wow, that's, well, all right, fine, guys. We could do better than that, or I could give you something, but I prefer not to. Okay. So now that I've kind of found what I was looking for, this is my inking pen. Uh, something that I I have many of, except for when I'm trying to find them. So, of course, it's impossible to find at that point. And this is in use tonight because my paint pen is dead. Uh, 
But as you can see, we kind of clear up a lot of lines, fill in some of the stuff that we were, you know, not 100% sharp on, and then also give just a lot more uh, sharpness and, and clarity, you know, throughout the piece. All right, folks, you got a real live end in here. You can ask some questions. Tom, have you ever played with your the color choice of your outline? I mean, or has that always what? been? Yeah. No, well, actually, no, I, I have. Um, and for me, um, I like the black when it's more cartoony. Um, you know, that's just a real traditional look. But if I'm doing something that is not um, so clearly a uh, comic book or, you know, I'm more um, apt to do that in something that is a painting or, um, Probably a digital piece. For this, you know, I, I have other options. I just really specifically use black uh, in this regard because it is such a help for cleanup. You can go over stuff, clean up lines. Um, and since black is the, the darkest color that I use at least, um, it's going to cover it up. It's going to give it that definition that I you know, didn't have otherwise. Um, all right. Um, making my way through these buffalo. Um, all right, well, I'm just trying to think of any uh, amusing anecdotes I could share. Um, I don't think I've really seen anything too weird on my, my Zoom, but you know, again, almost tripping and dying on my chair might've been a good one. Tom, do you have any other art projects going on right now other than the ones that are at the center? I'm currently in a couple of shows. Um, let's see, I have uh, a show that just opened here in Oklahoma um, that's called uh, Indigenous Creatures. Uh, it was a, obviously a play on the very recent um, faux pas by the news anchor for, I can't remember what, program, but uh, actually called thus indigenous creatures rather than indigenous creators, I think is what she was trying to say. So of course, you know, native people love that and they just ran with it and they're being utterly ridiculous and I love it. So yeah, um, this show was just kind of thrown together for Native American Heritage Month. And so it just made sense for us to kind of really um, lean into the indigenous creatures thing. Um, outside of that, I'm in a show that just opened in Spokane, Washington. That's a traveling exhibit that actually has been traveling for about six or seven years. Um, it's called Savages and Princesses. It's um, an exhibit that examines uh, stereotypes of Native American culture. Uh, and it's really cool. Um, I really enjoyed that. That was uh, a pretty early show for me. So again, it's, it's odd for me to even fathom that that show is still traveling around with artwork that I made uh, almost an embarrassingly long time ago. So um, I find that to be kind of an interesting aspect of what I do that um, I don't always think of the long-term shelf life of my work. And so I find that um, sometimes it's, it's odd for me. I'm like, oh man, I didn't even think this would still be going on now, you know? 
existence is one of those realities, I guess. And in doing this now, like I'm starting to see I'm like, okay, well, I like this, but for the size and aspect, I probably need a, a larger um, line. So now that I've got this sort of set up and the more refined things like his bow tie and stuff handled, I might go back even and do a thicker, more established outline uh, in a paint pen just because uh, I just think it'll look better. I think it'll look more finished. Mm -hmm. Sorry if this is <laughs> not the uh, the Bob Ross hour you were hoping for. <laughs> Happy little accidents and trees. Happy little buffalo. So, Tom, did, did you grow up watching Bob Ross? Oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> I love Bob Ross because I, you know, I channel hopped a lot when I was a kid. And I don't know why, but Bob Ross was always on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, it's it's an odd thing to me. There were, there were just instructional shows that I grew up with that were just always around that I just don't, you know, for example, Julia Child, mm -hmm. you know, the predecessor to the Food Network, yeah, was always on. I don't know how, but I could pretty much turn on TV anytime and watch Julia Child cook, or I could watch Bob Ross paint. Well, if there's tr if there's truth to the Bob Ross documentary that was out a while back, he was always on because there were people making all kinds of money off of him. <laughs> he, oh, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. I would love like that would be a huge addition to my collection. I would love an original Bob Ross. I don't even particularly like landscapes, but I just like the fact something that he created that was so endeared, you know, to people. I love Bob Ross. I mean, he's kind of got that um, Mr. Rogers vibe about him. Just that um, huge part of my childhood. And again, that's going back to nostalgia. Well, you mentioned ASMR. I think to a certain degree, there's something about his voice that is just oh yeah moving. you can just i mean he is a, a human calming agent for sure <laughs> see so yeah so now you can kind of see i really like that more prominent um outline and now i can just kind of go along a little faster not well not faster maybe but i'm not quite as uh, concerned with um, maintaining the the outline because it's already there. So now I can kind of just fatten it where I like it. And this is an interesting thing. Like I've never pondered on the idea of anybody wanting to know how I particularly do things. Um, but I do know that, that people do enjoy watching how um, art is made sometimes. And Bob Ross. But to me, I guess, like, because I'm self taught, uh, it's hard to kind of present myself from any uh, sort of um, hmm, expertise. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know if this is the right way to do this. It's just how I do. It's how it works best for me. And um, I think there's something kind of interesting about that and someone just, whoop, sorry. Not, um, not necessarily worrying about whether it's correct or not, just whether or not they like it. That to me, those are the artists that I'm, I'm always most interested in. It's like, because they probably have the most unique outlook or 
um, perspective because they're really probably doing something that they love. You mentioned that your your parents were collectors or are collectors. Yeah. Um, so were you surrounded? Was it specifically native art or art? Oh yes, yeah, they were native art collectors, and you know that they're they're a little odd in that you know um, the majority of native art collectors aren't not native. Right, right. And so they were always kind of a little bit of a peculiarity, um, and you know they just had some. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, they were, they have no business collecting anymore, but you can't tell them that. <laughs> like, they have no space in their home. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's. When does probably, a collector become a hoarder? Right. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, and that's, and that's a difficult thing for me to even talk about because I'm a big collector. Uh, I mean, I, one of the things I like about doing shows is the fact that I now, um, you know, have this whole group of peers that I'm also, I'm friends with, but also fans of. So it's amazing to me that, you know, I have all these amazing talented friends and not only do I get to see them in the regards to just doing art shows with them, but this is what I do professionally. I, I, I run a gallery and, um, I get to sell my friend's work and it's awesome. I get to be everyone's biggest fan and um, really promote their career. And uh, that's something I really enjoy. I absolutely love, um, you know, helping people that I'm a fan of be more successful. So now there are just certain things that, that, that oh, <laughs> I didn't realize you can't even really see what I'm doing. There are certain things that uh, I was pointing out that just become uh, something that I, I prefer to do. So I was down there really coloring and unnecessarily doing some coloring and shading that nobody else will notice, but I will. Um, there are just certain things about uh, stuff that I make that there's just for me that nobody else will probably notice. But the cool thing is, uh, what I love about what I make is when people do notice, when they do uh, understand reference, um, when you know I don't have to explain the story, and people just get it from the jump. That's very gratifying to me. So, are there any um, potential art collectors in the audience? Does anybody out there like art from that level? No. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of times, uh, I, know, I know myself, um, when I was, was younger, that collecting art seemed cost prohibitive. You know, you, you, the, the assumption was, oh, you know, every piece of art is thousands of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, it, it's it's nice to have learned that there are options, you know, smaller pieces or or um, prints of, of of work and things like that that you that you can you can own art you can own original art uh, and it doesn't have to cost that much and, and if you like it you know and it, it doesn't break your bank that's a great thing 
Yeah, I, I have found that um, for me, uh, it, it becomes a matter of, of um, priority. <laughs> I would never probably say that uh, as collectors, I mean, as collectors, my parents absolutely had the correct uh, priority. As their kid, yeah, I was like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, they were absolutely collectors first and foremost in their life. You know, that uh, there wasn't such a thing so much as like um, vacation. It was like, we're gonna go to Oklahoma. We're gonna go to these artist homes. We're gonna go to these shows. We're gonna meet, you know, meet some people. And it was always like, um, I was brought along for business <laughs> and that's, that was great because as an adult, I have an appreciation for it. As a kid at the time, I was not a fan, um, but uh, sorry, I'm trying to find one particular brush. So, so Anna, Anna says, I have a collection of wall art from artists that I love, though none of them are famous and pop art like the poster. My sister is also talented and I have pieces from her as well, which is always nice when you have a friend or a family member who's an artist that you can um, convince them to give you things. <laughs> My mom. 100%, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing when you can, and that's been a, a huge benefit to my collection is uh, I've been fortunate that I have friends who are fans of what I do. And so um, they are willing to take things on trade or, um, but I, you know, um, I had to learn to kind of prioritize where I wanted my collecting to be as far as importance goes. Now, I'd never, you know, I didn't do anything incredibly reckless, but there are definitely times when I <laughs> bought art when I probably shouldn't have. But I now, having gone through whatever trial was the result of that purchase, I'm happy that I did in that now I have that piece and I'll have it, you know, as long as I, as long as I have it or want it. And um, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, it's, it's not always the smartest play, but I, I don't know. I'm, it's how I was raised, I guess. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, my collecting um, started when I was 16 and uh, I received um, a painting by R.W. Giantai, who is a Kiowa artist who um, very much um, looks like a comic book artist, which is exactly why I like his work. Um, and I still have that piece to this day. And um, I can definitely remember though, when I was very, very first starting out and um, I had, you know, all the taste in the world, but not the, you know, the wherewithal or the funds. And so, um, you know, I was very uh, naively <laughs> approaching artists saying, well, hey, well, how much is that? Would you take payments, <laughs> you know? Um, it was definitely uh, a, an informal education, but uh, I really am kind of glad that I had that growing up because now I have a, little small collection that I can, you know, I'm kind of proud of. And, and I get to make the weird stuff that I make. And I'm sure none of this is coherent because I'm not really paying attention to what I'm saying. Okay. Hmm. Anytime I get kind of remotely close to a piece being finished, I sign it. I have odd, um, odd ideas about 
leaving things unfinished. So I'm, you know, even if it's not quite 100%, I still go ahead and sign them because I don't want to leave it undone and you know, forget or not get to finish it for whatever reason. Uh, so at this point, it's pretty much just a matter of uh, doing some small touch up. I'm going in and just filling in some stuff that wasn't quite perfect the first time. Um, just trying to give it a little bit more of a definition in the color scheme. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess you guys can unpin the drawing one. Let me see if I can unpin the drawing one. I can't find my myself here. Oh, there we go. Move in. Okay. So this is the complete piece. So this is Buffalo Man kind of literally being the black sheep of the stampede of Buffalo. Uh, it's really kind of the perfect representation of how I kind of see myself in uh, relation to the contemporary native art community. Um, so often the majority of comments that I get when people come in and see my work is like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and, you know, from that, it's usually um, just a lack of understanding. Uh, they're not quite sure, or maybe they're um, used to a, a little more, more of the, the pigeonholed idea of what they consider native art to be. And so um, they're not quite sure what to make of my stuff because it is a little bit out there. It's a little bit weird. It maybe challenges what they think of as native art. So um, that's the other thing I kind of like about what I make is that um, it's not necessarily what you expect it to be. And so uh, I like that. I like being a little bit different, um, but kind of being what I want to be. Oh, look at that. I almost, I, I finished with 10 minutes to spare. That was pretty good. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, do we have any last minute questions for Tom? You're getting applause. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Let's see. No, nope, thank you. Thank you <laughs> good. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And thank you uh, for sharing with us your artwork, your knowledge, your stories. And we really appreciate you um, doing this lecture for us tonight and this uh, demonstration. Um, Stephen, do you want to announce for our event for tomorrow? I would love to. <laughs> if uh, if you're a student uh, or faculty or staff, please uh, feel free to join us at 3.30 tomorrow at the center where we will be uh, screening uh, Prey, the film Prey, a P-R-E-Y. Uh, and then uh, afterwards at 5.30, as I said, Brent Learned will be joining us, uh, who a brand who contributed to the, um, the artwork in, in the film, particularly the end credits. And uh, that will be our final event. Um, I should probably mention that our, our uh, Catawba friends will be hosting their uh, festival this Saturday. If you've never been to uh, the Yapi Ishwa Fest Festival, the day of the Catawba Festival, uh, highly recommend it. And uh, then December 3rd at the center, we'll, we will be hosting an art and craft sale. And uh, this, this will be your opportunity, uh, as Tom talked about, to buy some art and to start collecting if you aren't. Um, and, and again, it's a, it's a great opportunity to buy 
um, a unique uh, holiday gift as well. Um, something that uh, you're not going to find at, at Walmart or, or even probably online. You right there, buy directly from the artist, find the story behind the piece that you buy. And um, I think all of the artists that we have are, are delightful people. I don't think we've had any jerks uh, <laughs> come in. So uh, <laughs> they're, they're all warm and welcoming and, and uh, happy to talk to you, just as, as Tom has been tonight. Um, they, they won't force you to ask questions, perhaps. But, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm pushy about that. I'll be happy to talk with you. Um, that's, that's all I have, Brittany. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. Um, thank you for coming, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all.